Hello, welcome to this week's debrief. I hope you're having a great day wherever you are. I am so glad that you are here today. It's actually a special edition of the Smarter News Debrief. Every week we do a debrief, which is our weekly deep breath when it comes to the news. Smarter News is about quick, concise, on partisan information seamlessly throughout your very busy week in this very busy news cycle. But once a week we take a deep breath and we look at some of the stories that are really rising to the surface that demand a little bit more attention. And I love this time of the week because it allows me to talk to you directly about some of the nuances of these news stories that really are the stories of our lives. And that's why news is important. Good journalism is important because we're actually telling our history as we're living it. But today we're going to do something very special. It's a special edition of the debrief because I'm actually going to be focusing on one event, one historic event, a historic event you're going to hear about in this news cycle. And so I figured it was worth the time just to pause and focus on the origin of Memorial Day. I'm recording this a couple days before Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a significant holiday in the United States. It's also a really special holiday in our household as well for a few personal reasons, which I'll share a little bit later on. But Memorial Day is that moment in, the, in America where we also pause and we also remember those that made the ultimate sacrifice for our nation and for the freedoms that we enjoy. But how did we arrive here? How did we arrive at Memorial Day? One of the great gifts of Smarter News, and I really want to say thank you for this. You are an inspiration on so many different levels, but one of the greatest gifts you give me is the inspiration to pause and ask, why do why are we doing this? What is really the backstory to all of this? Why does this even matter? And when we take a moment to pause to do that, to really find the heart of a news story or a historical event, we get to unpack all of these treasures, you know, all of these different storylines that really present to us a picture that is so much more enriched than I ever would have imagined. I grew up knowing about Memorial Day. Didn't we all grow up knowing something about Memorial Day? But there are so many things I've learned and discovered over the years that have only enriched my life. So I wanna share some of that with you, some of that reporting with you. You inspired it, and I hope this is also equally inspiring to you. Here's the challenge for today, though. This is a big challenge. So much about journalism today is really about fact-checking calling balls and strikes, right? Who's right, who's wrong? Tell me the truth, what are the facts? And reporting accurate information is really important to journalism. Absolutely, 100%. That is one of our commitments is accurate information. But sometimes good journalism is also about showing multiple sides of a story and presenting multiple perspectives and pulling the different threads of the story together at at least a place to pause. Sometimes we don't know how a story ends. Uh, we can't anticipate how it develops. All we can do is try to portray the different storylines that are out there, that exist. And that's what we're gonna do today with Memorial Day. You may not realize this, I certainly didn't, but there are more than 20 origin stories for Memorial Day. There are more than 20 places around the United States that claim that their particular site is the origin for Memorial Day as we know it. So there are many, many different stories. And my goal today is not to tell you which one is true. In fact, many historians have tried to do that and they still can't arrive at a single answer. And perhaps a single answer really isn't our goal. Perhaps the goal is to respect the story and how we arrived at this moment together. So here's my challenge to you today. I want you to ask yourself this question. What if it's all true? What if there's truth in every single storyline? What if all of these Americans from very different backgrounds with very different experiences living in very different regions arrived at a common destination, a common point with the desire to honor those who made the ultimate sacrifice? What if all the stories are true? What if all the stories are true? So with more than 20 stories, I'm not going to be able to go through all of them. But what I'm going to do is pick three of them. 
And maybe we pick three this year, maybe we pick three next year, and we learn a little bit each time. But I'm picking three of the stories that often rise to the surface yet again as the ones that are most commonly referenced. And we're also going to talk about the actual original Memorial Day done at a federal level, which is really when the tradition on a national level starts to begin and become a little bit more uniformed. Although, as you'll see in the proclamation, the goal is not for our celebrations to be uniform at all. So let's get started. One of the agreements about Memorial Day is that the origins do date back to the Civil War. The Civil War spanned 1861, 1865, the bloodiest battle uh, battles in American history, the bloodiest war in American history. It wasn't us fighting anyone on the outside. It was us fighting each other. And so really Memorial Day and the origins to it date back to around when the Civil War was ending in 1865. Some stories actually predate even that to 1864. But the three stories that I'm going to focus on today swirl around 1865, the end of the war, which actually happened officially in April 1865. And really that next period of time, that next year, as the country realizes they're going to mark a moment of a year since the Civil War ended. So a few different origin stories for you today. The first one we're going to go to is Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina was a site of extremely intense fighting, as so many places were in the Civil War. But on top of it, Charleston also had this horrendous fire that took place during the Civil War as well. And the whole city was just ravaged. Even dating before the Civil War, the city had dealt with hurricanes and so many other obstacles. So this is a city that has just been the epicenter of so much struggle. As the story goes, there were more than 250 Union soldiers that were being held in the city of Charleston. They were being held as prisoners of war. And they were actually being held at a racetrack, a horse racetrack, apparently. And one of the things that you should know about the Civil War is, of course, the, the battles were, were deadly and face-to-face combat, hand-to-hand combat. You know, you were really confronting, you know, brothers confronting brothers, friends confronting friends face-to-face. This was a very personal war. But many people died of disease. In fact, estimates are two-thirds of the deaths of the Civil War, which range, by the way, from 650,000 to 750,000. The numbers can change. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people are actually attributed to disease. And so something you should know about this is that for this particular story, for these particular Union soldiers, the way this story is told is that all of them died of disease and that they were very haphazardly buried at this racetrack in this destroyed city. And so according to a story that historian David Blight uncovered, and he uncovered looking through different archives, there was a very interesting turn of events as the war came to a close. And clearly this mass grave was something that the locals were very aware of. Here's what David Blight writes. He writes, after the Confederate evacuation of Charleston, black workmen went to the site, reburied the Union dead properly, and built a high fence around the cemetery. They whitewashed the fence and built an archway over an entrance on which they inscribed the words, Martyrs of the Race Course. Blight says that they did this, this mass reburial, and that in the next, the following days and weeks, there was a decision to have a a celebration that black and white Americans, there were Christian missionaries that were also there at the time, they came together for a celebration around this site. And the celebration included songs and parades and flowers that were laid on these new graves of the Union soldiers. There were speeches, and apparently there were also picnics. And so this is what happened in Charleston, South Carolina in 1865. And this is why David Blight says this is actually one of, on the record, one of the larger celebrations that we've seen that really make Memorial Day a moment. This happened in in, in the close of the war as we were going into springtime in America. And so this, this, he says, this is actually the origin of Memorial Day. However, those in Waterloo, New York, about 860 plus miles north would absolutely disagree with David Blight because they say Waterloo, New York is actually the site 
of the Memorial Day tradition in America. And here's how that story goes. So far north in Waterloo, there was a local pharmacist. And he really felt very passionately at the end of the war that we need to honor veterans, but specifically those who gave their lives in the Civil War. And he's talking about this in 1865, but he's having a hard time like getting people on board for what he actually wants to do. But then there was a local Civil War hero that hears about this and says, yes, absolutely, this is something that we should do. So in 1865, in May, in early May, the city arrange, arranges a parade. And they arrange that they're going to walk to the multiple cemeteries that are around this, this town, and they are going to place flowers on the graves and honor the graves of those that made the ultimate sacrifice in the Civil War. What they reference is the patriotic dead. So this is very specifically those that were killed in action. And so in Waterloo, New York, they still have it up on their website as the historic site of the original Memorial Day in America. You can actually apparently visit a museum there that goes through this particular story. However, that's still not the most common story. That's still not the most common story when it comes to Memorial Day. We have to go way south for that. And in fact, this is where it gets a little bit tricky and a little bit muddled because my impression of this, having looked at this for a couple years, is what happened in the South by women of the South actually created what we could describe now as a viral moment. And like any viral moment, sometimes it's difficult to track the exact origins. So as the story is told, there were women in Columbus, Georgia, and they decided that they were going to tend to the graves of Confederate soldiers. This apparently happened in 1866. So this is coming into the year, marking a year since the end of the Civil War. Those other stories that I just mentioned started in 1865 with the celebration in Waterloo happening in 1866. But apparently this happened in 1866 that a group of women got together. And again, who the women were and where exactly they were is a matter of some debate. Some say this happened in Georgia. Some say this happened in Mississippi. Some say others fudged the date and actually put their dates sooner than the other ones. But apparently, many women decided to do this. And one of the reasons why it's believed that many women decided to do this is because apparently one woman's group wrote to multiple papers and said, this is actually what we're going to do. The papers printed this story and apparently inspired others to follow in suit. And so what the Confederate women, these were, you know, women of the Confederacy, these were those that were tending to graves of Confederate soldiers. This is not like Waterloo, New York, where they're tending to the graves of the Union soldiers. This is in the South. But remember, at that time, if you were killed in action and you were a Union soldier and it happened in the South, you know, the likelihood that your family would be able to come and find you, let alone tend to your grave, was an impossibility. I mean, the chances of that were very, very small. And so the way this story goes is that the women were tending to the graves of Confederate soldiers, and they were placing flowers and wreaths. They were adorning the graves. And they noticed that there were other graves in the cemetery or in this area where many were buried. And these were Union soldiers. And they had a moment where they said to themselves, no one's going to come for them. No one's going to tend to their grave, but we're going to do that today. And so they decided not only to decorate the graves of their lost ones, but also decorate the graves of others who were lost as well. And you have to think about that moment, the war in the intensity of it was a nightmare for everybody. It was a nightmare of a war. These women that were tending the graves of Confederate soldiers or the black men that decided to rebury Union soldiers in Charleston or those that decided to honor the those that were buried in Waterloo, New York, they were honoring people that they knew. They were also honoring people that maybe they didn't know uh, they were remembering a war that certainly brought terror to their lives. You know, the fear of not only losing a loved one, but that the war would come to your front door. And what that would mean from, for you and your family is, is, it, is a thing of nightmares. You know, would they burn your home? Would they murder you? What, it was a violent, terrible war. 
And so this action by the women of the South apparently spread around the country because how the North and Northern papers interpreted it was that they were, they were in a sense forgiving. And actually one Washington DC paper wrote it in this way. The action of the ladies on this occasion in bearing whatever animosities or ill feeling may have been engendered in, engendered in the late war towards those who fought against them is worthy of all praise. And so the story of the women doing this, the image of the women doing this spreads all around the country. And it becomes something that people are talking about. They're writing about, there's poetry, there's songs. I'm going to read you one of them in a little bit that come out of this almost folklore. I mean, there, clearly something happened. Where it happened, the precise date, who did it first, we don't really know. But this particular image of the women tending to the graves is what ignited a more broad conversation of what this day could look like on a broader level. So that was all in 1866. And so these, these different Memorial Day celebrations are happening around the country. They're happening in different locations. People are being inspired. They're hearing songs. They're hearing poetry. They're doing it themselves. There was a feeling about doing a Memorial Day celebration. Remember, the war ends in April. So the idea was we're going to do the celebration to remember those who gave their lives in May. That's when, according to lore, this is part of the reason, this, that's when the most wildflowers in America are blooming. So we're going to have a lot of flowers that we're going to be able to adorn the graves with. We're not marking the end of the war. The end of the war at that time, by the way, depending on where you lived, may feel like a different date. But we're going to do this in May as we're going into summer. And this is going to be a moment that we're going to honor those who gave their lives. And we're going to honor both Union and Confederate soldiers so this is happening around a country that's trying to navigate itself out of this terrible, terrible chapter. You know, there's no blueprint for the way forward and how this is all going to work out, you know, how America is actually going to survive this. And if you remember, we talk, talk, talked a little bit about this on, on Smarter News, Arlington National Cemetery was a new concept. It was something that came up partly because of need. There were so many who were dying around Washington, D.C., and there was a need to be able to put the bodies in a place uh, that, that could hold them, that there would be enough land. And here was this big estate that was available that was taken over by Union forces. So Arlington National Cemetery is new. It's only been open for a few years. It's very active. And now that the war is over, General Logan... A, a Civil War veteran himself, who's the head of a very large and powerful veterans organization at the time. He is the one that really puts Memorial Day down as an official holiday. And on May 5th, 1868, he maps out what Memorial Day would look like. And this is a Memorial Day order. At this time, this celebration of Memorial Day would happen at Arlington Cemetery. President Grant's who headed up the Union forces at one time, was going to be present there. A few thousand people were going to be present at Arlington Cemetery. Their mission then was that they were going to set out American flags and that they were also going to tend to the graves. And believe it or not, since 1868, almost exactly the same thing has happened every year at Arlington. Amazing. So I want to read to you directly the order that was given on May 5th for this celebration that would happen on May 5th. 30th. So the 30th day of May 1868, writes General Logan, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion, the Civil War, and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form or ceremony is prescribed. He's saying, Nothing official is prescribed here, but posts and comrades will in their own way arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. So he's saying this is going to happen on, on May 30th. He goes on to say, we should guard their graves with sacred vigilance. Let no vandalism or avarice or neglect, no ravages of time, 
testify to the present or to the coming generations that we have forgotten as a people the cost of free and undivided republic. And other eyes grow dull, and other hands slack, and other hearts cold in the solemn trust. Ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warmth of life remains in us. Let us then, at the time appointed, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with choicest flowers of springtime. Let us raise above them the dear old flag they saved from dishonor. Let us, in this solemn presence, renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us as sacred charges upon the nation's gratitude, the soldiers and sailors, widow and orphans." He ends it with, it is the purpose of the commander in chief to inaugurate this observance with the hope it will be kept up from year to year while a survivor of the war remains to honor the memory of his departed comrades. He earnestly desires the public press to call attention to this order and lend its friendly aid in bringing it to the notice of comrades in all parts of the country in time for simultaneous compliance therewith. So look at that. He's he's talking about the press. He's like, press, get on board. You need to spread the word. We got a couple of weeks. May 30th is going to be the day. But what words to think about? We should guard their graves with sacred vigilance. Let no vandalism of avarice or neglect, no ravages of time testify to the present or to the coming generations that we have forgotten as a people the cost of a free and undivided republic. Really powerful words. So May 30th becomes the day. May 30 becomes Memorial Day. And it isn't until 1971 that Congress decides that it should be a three-day weekend and it would take place in the final weekend of May. And by the way, Congress did that for several holidays because there was the thinking that it was going to be good for the economy, that people were going to get a break, and that uh, we're going to have a three-day weekend to shop. And so there actually is, I know, that feeling of it's Memorial Day, but there's sales, you know, like why are there say sa- why are we celebrating with sales? A happy Memorial Day and the 50% off coupon. You know, it feels like a little bit disjointed, but that actually is something that dates back to the 1970s as a purpose of lawmakers to try to get the American people to shop and to be involved in the economy. So that that is actually intentional by lawmakers, although certainly not at the time of General Logan. So that's where the 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 date May 30th comes to pass. And it just by happenstance this year, May 30th is Memorial Day is Monday. And there are a couple things that will happen on Memorial Day. There will be uh, a presentation that happens at Arlington National Cemetery. There will be others around the country. And as you can see from, from General Logan's, even his first order, he's giving some direction of what to do, but he's also giving some freedom about how to do it. He just wants it to be done at the end of May. And so as this celebration is gaining momentum, now you're getting even more people involved and we're seeing more of the poetry and the songs and all of that that comes to pass, which we often see now in parades around the country, for example, or songs that you might hear a band play. I just wanted to read you. This is this is actually from 1870. So this is two years after Memorial Day becomes an official holiday in the United States. And the lyrics, I think, just touched me. I just, I, I had a hard time reading them. So hopefully I can keep it together. But I thought it was so beautiful. So this is the song, The Soldier's Memorial Day. And it says this, when flowery summer is at hand and spring has gemmed the earth with bloom, we hither bring with loving hand bright flowers to deck our soldier's tomb. Gentle birds above are sweetly singing over the graves of heroes brave and true, while the sweetest flowers we are bringing wreathed in garlands of red, white, and blue. With snowy hawthorn, clusters white, fair violets of heavenly blue, and early roses fresh and bright, we wreath the red and white and blue. So here's the nation moving forward, trying to get a couple, some distance from the end of the Civil War, and now Memorial Day, a day that wasn't observed in the same way before the Civil War is now part of American tradition. And it is a day where there are a lot of conflicting feelings, aren't they? Because it is a day that in, in time you can feel sort of loses some of its meaning. Do you ever feel that way? So I just wanted to share this personally with you. You know, I was born actually on Memorial Day. I was born on May 30th. And 
you know, growing up in San Francisco, California, there was not a Memorial Day parade that we necessarily attended. I didn't really have any connection to any war. The only connection I had was my grandfather was a war correspondent in World War II for the Associated Press. And so that felt like a tether somehow. But growing up, I didn't know anything about why all the American flags were out. It seemed like another patriotic holiday like July 4th, you know, just sort of just something else that you mark. It was great to have a three-day weekend. Sometimes it hit on my birthday, which was a score, you know. And I also was raised not too far away from the Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco where, you know, that was the site of all the anti-war protests. So it wasn't until very recently until I met my husband, who is a veteran. He was active duty at the time. He was serving in the Navy. And he has deployed multiple times to war zones that I actually had this personal connection suddenly with war. And I'm sharing this with you. I don't like to insert myself into what we're talking about, but I'm sharing this with you because for some of you, you know, this whole idea of Memorial Day, the origins could be brand new. And maybe you don't necessarily have that personal connection to war. And sometimes that can feel a little bit separating. And I just want to tell you, I, I understand that because I've lived both experiences. I've lived having no connection at all to then suddenly having a very deep connection. And so Memorial Day is a complicated holiday for us. It's compli- It's my birthday, right? That's sometimes a time to celebrate, although recently not as much of a celebration, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but, you know, it's my birthday. We have that event happening. But Memorial Day is a, it's a solemn time for us. It's a time that is is not without shedding tears. Two of my sons are named for teammates of my husband who were killed in action. One killed, the first Navy SEAL killed in Iraq, Mark Lee. That's my eldest son is named after him. And my youngest son is named after Ryan Job, who was severely injured uh, in that same operation around that same time that Mark Lee was killed. And it was a couple years later that he he passed away um, as part of an operation that was continuing to repair his wounds that he incurred from battle. So we have two, you know, my two babies are named after those who made the ultimate sacrifice. This is a hard weekend for my husband. I know no matter how much he loves us, he has said it time and time again, and I know he means it and I can respect it, believe it or not, even though it can be, you know, there's no way to, there's There's only the one way to take him at his word, which he says, if he could do anything, he would trade places with any one of them. And I know that to be the case. War is very complicated. Um, The news is very nuanced. Memorial Day holiday is a time when you can tear up looking at the American flag and also go shopping and have a barbecue with friends and do all these sort of things that you wonder, how did they all fit together? How did they all fit together? How do all these stories, all these stories fit together? So many of our stories that we're covering require us to recognize that there's a lot of different emotions and conflicting emotions or conflicting feelings about a story at the same time. We've really lived that existence for the last couple of years. And it's okay to put out our hands every once in a while and be like, there's a lot of conflicting things here. There's a lot of conflicting history. There's a lot of conflicting emotions. There might even be conflicting facts, and it's okay. We're just going to hold them in our hands. We're going to sit with them, and, and that's okay. The story is still developing. It's like a great American quilt. There's a lot of different threads, and each each time that we talk about a story about our origin, it's like pulling at these different threads, weaving them together, and hopefully at the end of the day, we have this amazing tapestry that is our country and is our lives, and in a strange way, as we weave all these different threads together, we realize that we're actually really connected. So those are my thoughts on Memorial Day 2022, thinking about Memorial Day 1864, 1865, 1866, 1868. And one of the really cool things to take away from this is that look at all this time that has passed and we're still really doing the same thing. We've actually really kept the tradition. So on this Memorial Day, I'm grateful, you know, grateful to all those who made the sacrifice so that we can live free. A free press equals a free people pursuing their own storyline. And that's something I want Smarter News to be about cultivating. So thank you for being with me today as we talk about a really important day in American history, an important part of the year where we're able to pause, almost a dividing line between the first part of the year and the second half. I know it's not quite there for math, 
<laughs> but it feels like that we're going into summer. We're going into the kind of the back, getting ready for the back half of 2022. And I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for this opportunity to go a little bit over the history. I'm going to make sure to put links to all of these different stories underneath this on our website because there's a lot to check out. There's I only skimmed the surface. There's a lot more to all of these. And if you have a moment and you'd like to look at it, then I encourage you to do so. So thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for your continued support of SmartNews.com. Have a wonderful, special Memorial Day. Quick, concise, nonpartisan, smarter news, a refuge from the storm. I'm Jenna. Thank you for choosing smarter.